Great, thank you. And you heard it here. This is the highlight, this talk of the entire program. So <laughs> listen up. I'm, I'm Susan Clark. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford where I work with all of these wonderful people and more. And I want to use my time here today to talk about one of the greatest laboratories we have for observing a turbulent medium in the universe. That's the ISM, the interstellar medium of our own Milky Way galaxy. And I want to start this largely theoretical meeting by talking about some of the really non-trivial observational constraints that we have on this turbulent magnetic interstellar medium. And so just to quickly orient us here, I'm going to be talking about several observational tracers and clever ways that we can combine measurements to figure out the physical properties of the ISM. So I will, I will use in this talk gas and dust emission, gas absorption from various ISM lines, and two tracers of the magnetic field structure in the dusty neutral ISM, starlight polarization and polarized dust emission. So we're going to focus on the neutral dusty component of our multi-phase interstellar medium. And we're not just going to use these, these classical tracers that you've read about in your ISM textbooks, but we're going to make use of really complicated information that's encoded in the morphology of the ISM. One of the things that we have access to when we observe the gas and dust emission in our own galaxy is, is structure in the resolved emission or, or hyperspectral data that we observe. And this structure is encoding physical information. If we can just figure out ways to extract that information and ask questions of our data. And so some of the data that I've used a great deal in my work is our observations of the 21 centimeter neutral atomic hydrogen line. This is 21 centimeter emission from the Milky Way galaxy panning across your screen. And you can see by eye in, this, uh, in these images of channel map structure of the emission, of the emission at particular velocity channels, you can see all sorts of very intricate structure. And I hope to convince you in the next few minutes here that there's really information encoded in that structure on both the structure of the interstellar magnetic field and also the phase structure of this multi-phase neutral medium in our galactic ISM. And so one of the very early ways that we uh, analyzed these data when we first had them, this is um, four arc minute resolution observations from Arecibo, uh, and so this is this panning across your screen is the whole sky as visible to Puerto Rico, about a third of the entire sphere. One of the thir first things we did is ask about the evident linear structure in a lot of the diffuse regions of sky that we observe here. And one thing you can do is write down some sort of machine vision algorithm to quantify the orientation of linear structures in these data, and then compare that to observations that we have of the magnetic field orientation in, in the dusty neutral medium. And when you play that game, what you find is that the orientation of these linear neutral structures in this H1 emission are extremely well aligned with the magnetic field that we can measure in either the dust polarization or the polarized dust emission, which is the plane of sky projection of the magnetic field orientation, the plane of sky component, integrated through the dust, either to basically infinity in the case of your dust emission or to your star in the case of your starlight polarization. So the top panel shows in the, in the brush structure line integral convolution the orientation of linear structures in diffuse high galactic latitude neutral hydrogen. And the bottom panel shows the plane of the sky magnetic field orientation measured by Planck at 353 gigahertz. The little white 
line segments in both show you optical starlight polarization measurements. This is a this is a pretty picture, and you can see by eye how well correlated these things are. But uh, also quantitatively, these are very tightly coupled to one another. And with the H1, we also have access to line of sight information, not directly in distance, but in the form of Doppler shifted velocity of the H1 line. So we measure the H1 emission as a function of line of sight velocity. And it turns out that you can use the orientation of H1 structures as a function of that line of sight velocity. And the more disordered the H1 orientation is along the velocity axis, the more depolarized the thermal dust emission is. And so we have basically in this, in this three-dimensional position-position velocity measurement of the gas distribution, something that's sensitive to the tangling of the magnetic field structure that we measure in the dust polarization. And a few years ago, my colleague Brandon Hensley and I took these uh, and, and several other lines of evidence about how the dust, more, the dust magnetic field is related to the H1 morphology and, and articulated that everything we knew in putting forward a mapping between our measurements of the H1 distribution and a space that we thought should be informative about the structure of the magnetic ISM. The idea is basically just to take your data and map them into velocity orientation space. So I'm, I'm plotting here velocity on the radial axis of the right-hand panel here. And the orientation of linear structures in H1 azimuthally on this plot. And our, our uh, hypothesis, if you will, is that structures that are sitting in distinctly oriented magnetic fields somewhere along the line of sight should generically map to disparate parts of this velocity orientation space. And, and we're really just performing this mapping. This is, this is not really a, a model that introduces any physical uh, information about how the dust is related to the, the gas, other than to say, I take my observed emission and I map it uh, sight line by sight line into this distribution of, of velocity and orientation. And when you do that, you can come up with something analogous to the Q and U Stokes parameters of linear polarization, but here defined purely by the geometry of the neutral hydrogen emission. And if you want, as a function of line of sight velocity rather than just one measure integrated over the sky, like we always are, are stuck with in the polarized thermal dust emission. And then, of course, you can integrate your H1-based Q and U maps and, and have your purely morphology-based distribution of your, your H1-based magnetic field something uh, and, and compare it to your actual measurements of, of the polarized thermal dust emission and, and its probe of the magnetic field. And so this is showing you on the left something based purely on the geometry of H1. On the right, the real measurements of the Planck thermal dust emission. And top to bottom, you have the QU Stokes parameters of linear emission, the, the polarization angle, and the polarization fraction. And so this gives you sort of a, a null hypothesis with which to compare your actual measurements of the dust polarization to understand what's attributable purely to this geometric structure of what we think is, is something very correlated with the magnetic field. And, and uh, so, for example, you know, you can look at this bottom panel here, and to the extent that this polarization fraction in the H1 base map is correlated with the measured polarization fraction, that's immediately telling you that the, the variation over the sky here isn't due to dust grains being better aligned in some places than others, right? All this map knows about is the geometry of the gas distribution. And so clearly that, that it's, the, it's the depolarization due to the geometrical tangling 
of the magnetic field within your beam or along the line of sight that, that must be causing that large-scale correlation between these two maps. And we can get uh, way further into the weeds of what sort of dust polarization statistics we can interrogate differently having this sort of null hypothesis, pure geometry, H1-based idea. And, uh, and so, for example, what you can demonstrate is that in the H1-based maps, we reproduce certain properties of the dust polarization. This, this slide is a little bit for the experts, but I know uh, Alexei is going to be talking more about dust polarization statistics soon, and I, I hope we'll get even deeper in. So, for example, though, for the experts in the room, we do reproduce the excess of the parity even component of the polarization, the E mode polarization, over the B mode component. And we reproduce this correlation between the dust total intensity and that parity even component because that is driven by a preferential alignment of the magnetic field along anisotropic dust density structures which are similarly traced in the structure of the cold gas in the H1. And, and you can even show that if you have uh, enough small misalignments with the same handedness, you can uh, predict or, or produce uh, non-zero parity odd quantities in the polarization as well. And you'll notice that I am referring to the structures that drive this magnetic alignment as cold gas density structures. This is something that is now very clear, but, but for a while there was a bit of a question. There was an alternative idea that maybe the, the magnetically aligned structures, or in, and in general, the small scale structure that you measure in a narrow channel map of H1 emission, there was a claim that this was actually an imprint of the turbulent velocity field and uncorrelated with the underlying density field, that, that these were uh, so-called velocity caustics or somehow due to velocity crowding. That's a, that is a testable prediction, and it's not borne out in the data. The, the short, so the short answer to whether or not this is actually a velocity effect is no. The much longer answer is that from a number of different observational probes, we can test and rule out the idea that these structures are due to velocity caustics. So, for example, we see a very strong correlation between the small-scale channel map structure and the broadband far infrared emission. It doesn't know anything about velocity structure along the line of sight. And that correlation is, is not uh, measurably lost as you move to thinner and thinner velocity channels. Um, and, um, and not only that, I mean, we can, we can test this in a completely orthogonal way with sodium-1 absorption. Uh, you can actually use sodium-1 absorption from Sloan spectra uh, to test this picture, and, and it's inconsistent with the data to say that these are velocity caustics. Instead, what all of these different uh, ways of probing the data support is that what's predominantly structuring the small-scale channel map emission and what is predominantly responsible for this observed magnetic alignment between the H1 emission and the magnetic field orientation are preferentially cold, denser regions of the H1 gas. This is the, the cold neutral medium, the CNM, that has in general a narrower line width and, and a stronger contribution to the small scale intensity structure in a narrow channel map of emission. And we've, we recently have, a, if you want to think of it this way, a, a new way of showing that it really is the phase structure of the gas that's responsible for this small scale structure. Uh, but actually, independent of ruling out the idea that these are velocity caustics, we have a really cool new result. This is work led by my grad student, Min Ji Lei, absolutely fantastic work where we've asked ourselves what information might be encoded in the velocity of the channel map emission of H1 that is related to our direct measurements of the phase structure of the gas from absorption line measurements that can directly constrain the spin temperature. So that the absorption line measurements 
come from work led by uh, Claire Murray and Smizana Sinimorovich and others. And so the idea is to, is to first write down some sort of flexible quantification of the morphology of the H1 emission. So we're not going to preordain that we're looking for filaments or any particular structure. And to do that, we have turned to a technique called the wavelet scattering transform, which you may have come across uh, in many areas of science right now. Uh, this is, is very simple and very flexible. Essentially, the, the wavelet scattering transform is you take some image, some emission, in our case, a channel map of the H1 emission. You convolve it with a predefined set of wavelet kernels with different scales and orientations. And, and then you simply take a spatial modulus uh, average over each of your images to have one set of, of coefficients. And then you can do that again. You can, you can convolve the modulus of your convolved image again with your set of wavelets so that you now have a second order probe of the scale and orientation interactions of structure in your image. And if this looks to you like a diagram you've seen explaining to you how a convolutional neural net works, this, that's not a coincidence, right? This was developed by mathematicians as a way to explore what it is that CNNs are doing when they, when they tell us what's a cat and what's a dog on the internet. But for us, we like this because it, it gives us a set of coefficients that very flexibly describe the geometry of anything in an image and in an interpretable way. So we can then, for example, uh, select the set of coefficients that describe structure that at two different scales is oriented the same direction. So the, the suite of wavelets that have the same orientation at two different scales, or the set of wavelets that have orthogonal orientation at two different scales, just to take two very intuitive examples. And we can also use the, the wavelet scattering coefficients as in our, our loss function with good old gradient descent. And so you can uh, make synthetic images that give you an intuitive sense of what it, what's happening in the image space when you crank up one coefficient or, or another, right? And so here, just to give you a sense, if you, if you increase this S perpendicular coefficient where your two wavelets are orthogonal to one another, you get much fluffier image structure. If you, if you crank up the parallel one, uh, you, you will create something that has sharper, more elongated, more filamentary structure. We compute this on uh, channel maps of the H1 emission where we have coincident, it's spatially and in velocity space, coincident measurements of the CNM mass fraction from absorption toward background quasars. And what we find when we play this game is that the structure of the H1 emission is extremely correlated with this CNM mass fraction and in ways that, that we would have predicted based on our understanding of these filamentary cold structures that are, are aligned with the magnetic field, which is to say that this S parallel coefficient at small scales is nicely correlated with the CNM mass fraction, that, that the perpendicular component is actually anti-correlated with the CNM mass fraction, and that there's a, a whole richness to the morphology here, I think, still to explore. And the final and very non-trivial constraint on the ISM magnetic structure that I want to leave you with today is again work by Minji Lei where now we're asking, okay, what can we jointly infer from measurements of the H1 phase structure from this, this uh, fraction of the gas mass in this cold neutral medium? From this very tight correlation between CNM structures and the dust polarization and from other measurements of the dust polarization, just physical properties that we have from Planck. And one of the things that we've found that I'm excited to discuss with people here is that the, the polarization fraction of the dust in the diffuse high galactic latitude ISM where, where the H1 emission 
and the dust emission are very tightly correlated, so very low column density lines of sight. The dust polarization fraction is correlated with the CNM mass fraction in this medium. And in that same medium, it is uncorrelated with the total H1 column. We can write down a cartoon model of the ISM that would have this be true by saying, OK, let me take some fraction of my total column and put it in the CNM. Let me take the rest of my column and, and call it the rest of my column, call it the not CNM, call it the warm neutral medium if you want. It really includes the unstable medium as well. And we can say, OK, well, if I have less geometric depolarization within my CNM path length, within my fraction of the column that is in, associated with this cold neutral medium, I will have the polarization fraction positively correlated with FCNM. And so let's just model that as, as a zero disorder component of my line of sight, and then we can constrain the geometric depolarization from the dispersion of the magnetic field in the rest of the column by fitting this cartoon model to our measurements of the correlation between the dust polarization fraction and the CNM mass fraction. And so we write down the mathematical version, the, the Bayesian hierarchical model that goes with this little cartoon, and we can constrain, we can drive a number for the dispersion or the, the dispersion to the magnetic field orientation that gives you this geometric depolarization in the dust associated with the rest of the column that's not uh, the CNM column. And when, so we get this number that, that uh, the dispersion, the way we've parameterized it of this non-CNM component is, is, gives rise to an effective polarization fraction that's like 0.2 of the, whatever the polarization fraction is in the CNM associated component. And so I'm, I'm excited to think with people here about some of the implications of this and, and some of the different questions we can ask, especially about how this might, what this might be telling us about the three-dimensional geometry of the magnetic field uh, and its dependence on phase. Um, in particular, the path length between the CNM and the rest of the column is quite different. And so I, I would love to talk to people doing detailed work with multi-phase numerical simulations about what we can learn from these data. OK, and so to conclude for you, observations of the ISM have a wealth of morphological information. If we can just be clever about how to get it out, we can learn about the structure of three-dimensional magnetic fields, about the phase structure of the ISM. And, and we've recently put some of this together to have a new constraint on the magnetic field disorder between phases of the neutral ISM. So very much looking forward to being here with you for a few weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susan, for your very interesting talk. I asked the audience here for questions, and we have the first question by CO. And uh, everybody, please just line up. You, Go ahead, yeah. you have a question. Yes, this is a yes. nice talk. Thank you. So, um, if I understand correctly, this comparison is between the H1 structure seeing velocity China, so velocity space, and comparing to the magnetic field integrated along the line side in real space. Um, so, I mean, uh, it's a bit surprising for me to see the alignment. Do we know which particular velocity China we should look at to see this uh, alignment, or it happens on all single? Uh, channels. Good, thank you. Okay, so this is indeed an alignment seen in the structures in narrow channel maps of emission, but not because it's a velocity space effect, it's because what's driving the magnetic alignment are colder, cold neutral medium structures which have these narrow line widths that mean that they are best probed by velocity channels of say a few kilometers per second. And then what we do is measure that 
the orientation of those structures in many different velocity channels along the line of sight. And it's the, the, when I show you something like this, it's the integrated intensity weighted orientation of the H1 morphology as a function of, of that line of sight velocity. And that is what is extremely well correlated with the dust polarization. The dust polarization is doing that line of sight integral for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mark Morica yep. and the others. Please uh, go, line up behind the microphone. You can already stand up. Yes, please. Hi. Um, lovely talk. <laughs> the dust polarization is also going to sample the uh, molecular medium, but your H1 is not. Um, the, I, I expect from, uh, you know, Ibanez Mejia at all, that the magnetic field deep inside the molecular medium is going to be more chaotic because of self-gravity than the CNM envelopes of those clouds or just random CNM regions. Can you tell the difference? Can you get at the molecular as well? Uh, this is a great question and you're, you're making me wish I had put a particular slide in my backup slides. <laughs> I, I suspect, yes, it will take uh, an analysis that includes that data directly. Where we see this correlation is explicitly in uh, regions that have a column of 4 by 10 to the 20 or less, H1 column. Perfect. And so there's, there's negligible uh, um, molecular gas here. But if you look at this correlation at higher column densities, you actually see the same anti-correlation that you see between the total H1 column and the and the dust polarization fraction. And Plunk did some nice work to that uh, at that at higher, much higher column densities. And so I, I suspect that that is one in the ingredients of uh, a way that would actually let you disentangle exactly that. I'd be curious to think more about that in simulation as well. Yeah, Great. thank you. Thank you. Next question here, please. Okay, for the uh, code neutral media you mentioned, I think in our study also, other group study, we find uh, the code neutral media are not necessarily parallel to magnetic field, it could be perpendicular to magnetic field. So, but in your case, if velocity channels, the H1 structure are always parallel to the magnetic field. So I wonder if you can comment on the possible reason. Uh, okay, so this is, these are observational data, right? So, so what we're saying is that there is a very tight statistical correlation in the observations between the CNM filamentary elongated anisotropic structure and the local magnetic field orientation. And, and so, for example, again, at much higher column densities, like Mordecai has mentioned, uh, there's, there's very nice evidence from Planck data that shows that you start to lose this preferred alignment between the density structures and the magnetic field orientation, and, and maybe evidence even for a preferentially orthogonal alignment once you get to the molecular cloud uh, scales. Um, but, but here we're talking about diffuse media where the observations show actually very tight correlation. Yes, I mentioned, what I, the, actually what I mean here is actually multi-phase H1 simulation. In that simulation, we find H1 could be, code neutral media could be perpendicular to magnetic field, field not just the very high column density one. Oh, well, then you might want to ask what is wrong with your simulations, that they're not reproducing <laughs> the data. <laughs> Thanks. Next question, please. Hi, uh, so I'm, I'm name is, my name is Dmitry Pagosian, so... Oh, hi, the, yes, mm -hmm. it's so nice to finally meet you. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not sure I, I subscribe that there is no uh, bad advertisement, so let's go back to yes. one paper. <laughs> Speak closer to the mic, please. Oh, it's the mic? Uh, yes, please, thanks. All right, I'm trying to... Uh, this might be more uh, this go a little side. bit back. No, it was Pagosian Lazarian, Lazarian Pagosian 2001. Oh, here it is. So uh, I'm not going to argue about morphology in velocity channels. Is it velocity or is it density currently? Uh, what I would like just to stress that 2001 paper has nothing to do with that, right? So it's. Uh, so I want to take it out so, from so this, this discussion. So this is here because this is the paper that is cited by the Lazarian yes. group and all of their papers uh, that claim so, so, that these structures so, so, are 
Yeah, so, 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 so I have a feeling that within a program I will have to do a seminar and yes. run through this paper. That would paper, be great. Run through this paper once again. But it was concerned about the effect of velocity mapping on measured intensity to point statistics like power spectrum depending on the thickness of a slice and it was studied in different regime uh, uh, of power, of underlying power should... spectrum of velocity and density. And so, so, so in that sense... I will ask you during the discussion session to bring that up again. I yeah, think this nothing... leads to a longer discussion. I have uh, a next, very clear next answer to that. Yeah. By, next question by Elliot, please. Yeah, nothing to do with channel maps. Um, so it was a very nice talk. I'm curious about... Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very close. So I was curious about the correlation between synchrotron polarization and other tra tracers of the multiphase ISM and what that tells us about where most of the synchrotron emission is coming from and what the field structure is in those regions. Oh, that's a great question. And you're, you're making me wish I had a slide showing some nice recent work by Jessica Campbell and uh, in, in some um, DALFAX data, a nice recent work by Andrea Bracco uh, and others uh, using LOFAR data. We see sometimes this morphological correspondence between the Planck measured magnetic field orientation, between the cold gas structures in the H1 channel maps, and between synchrotron uh, measurements of the of the magnetic field orientation, not ubiquitously though it seems, and so and so the the we have two I think important constraints on this problem from the observations right now. One is that sometimes you see this very clear morphological alignment, and two is that you don't always see that, which makes you wonder if you need a very particular geometry or if you need your synchrotron observations to, to happen to be selecting a very okay, particular already. part of your path length in order to have that, that observation. But yeah, I'd love to talk more Great. about that. Thank you. Thanks. I will ask Christoph to set up his computer. Betsy, please ask your question. Um, Susan, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the origin of these filaments predominantly aligned with the magnetic field, which makes sense in the more diffuse media if these filaments are, for instance, uh, uh, formed as a consequence uh, uh, at the end as a consequence of isobaric thermal instabilities mm -hmm. with magnetic fields. Do you have any insights on this? Oh, I, I want to talk about this at great length with, with you, and I think we're going to hear a few talks soon about from people doing direct numerical simulations that include thermal instability. So, so we will talk, talk again about, about this during yeah. the discussion. Thanks very much again, Susan, for a very wonderful talk.